at Second Peter. We are in chapter 2. Who remembers what the theme was of the last lesson? There is a hint up there. Cultivating a Christ-like character. Second Peter is all about looking at the enemy within. So we started off with 1 Peter. 1 Peter, the theme was living in holiness with hope in a hostile world. The early Christians at that time, this is in the 60s AD, uh, Caesar Nero was persecuting them. And a lot of them were dying in very gruesome ways. And Peter is writing a a letter of encouragement to these Christians, and he's saying, you have to live holy lives as God himself is holy, you be holy. And it's not just this unrealistic message that Peter gave them, because it's like, Peter, come on, we're dying here, is that all you can say? But there's also hope in the message, knowing that Christ suffered as well. And in First Peter, over and over, Peter gives the example of Jesus being uh, that suffering servant. And so in Second Peter now, this is the last letter Peter wrote, and he is giving a huge warning, still going on with living as being holy with hope, but now in a heretical church. It seems like false teachers have been coming up left and right. This is 30 years after Uh, Jesus had ascended to heaven. By this time, uh, most of the apostles had been martyred. And Peter and Paul were one of the last remaining, and then John would continue on for another over 30 years. Um, And so as you can imagine, with that very first um, wave of authority, of leadership in the church, leaving this world, a lot of false teachers would spring up. And so Peter is dealing with heresies in the church and how to detect them, and specifically how to detect heretical teachers. And it almost seems overwhelming because we think, well, if the teachers are the ones that are becoming heretical, uh, and if they're the ones that don't get the word and should have gotten the word right, then how about us as just merely members in the church? And Peter's message is very hopeful. So he starts off in chapter 1 and he says, look, it's easy to detect heresy because you always have to look at the fruits. Just like Jesus said, you will know a tree by its fruit. And so 1 Peter chapter 1 is all about knowing what is true. What does it look like? for a Christian to be truthful in his relationship with the Lord and in his walk with the Lord and to be sincere. And so Peter takes us on this journey of cultivating a Christ-like character. When you do that, you will go on this journey from faith all the way through love. And he explains these seven simple steps. So now we find ourselves in chapter 2, and Peter doesn't give any directives here. All he does is he goes after and he condemns these false teachers. So he gave us what a true picture looks like, and in chapter 2 he gives us what a false picture looks like of a false Christian. So, I'll send out the PowerPoint. So here's the outline of chapter 2. First, he starts off by talking about the danger of false teachers and what they bring about, the demise of false teacher, their doom, the depravity, the things that are ugly uh, in their lives, and then the deceptions that they want to propagate within the church. So let's dive right into chapter 2, verse 1. But, There were also false prophets among the people, even as there will be false teachers among you who will secretly 
bring in destructive heresies, even denying the Lord who bought them and bring on themselves swift destruction. And many will follow their destructive ways because of whom the way of truth will be blasphemed. By covetousness, they will exploit you with deceptive words. For a long time, their judgment has not been idle and their destruction does not slumber. So here's the danger of false teachers that Peter brings about. And first of all, he warns us of this danger by really speaking prophetically in verse 1. He says, just like in the Old Testament there were false prophets, he didn't say there are, even though that was obvious. He says there will be. There will be. And that means all the way up through our day and age, there will be false prophets. Now, these false prophets don't advertise themselves as such. So, don't expect somebody to come into church and to say, I am that secret spy. I am that person that wants to come in here and just destroy all of you guys. No, they will secretly try to be deceptive. And one of the things that Peter says here in verse 2, and this is their popularity, he says, many will follow. Many will follow. And we see this to be the case, not just in terms of church sizes, right? There's mega churches out there of 10, 20, 50,000 people who are being deceived by one leader, but there's also entire false denominations that are being deceived by these kind of leaders. And so P Peter says, watch out. He's prophesying and giving us a warning that there will be He's saying that these people will be very popular. But one thing to note, he said, and one thing is certain, that there will be punishment. It's not like God is looking at all of this and he's saying, you know what, I don't care. Anyway, I have my plans reserved, you know, for the second coming of Jesus. No, he's saying their punishment is not idle. It's going to be coming. And he says that by covetousness, they will exploit you with deceptive words. And it says, for a long time, their judgment has not been idle. You know, this is one of the biggest, um, you know, things that these false teachers will even propagate. They'll say, well, if, if I'm, you know, false, if somebody tries to uh, contend with them, they're like, well, then the Lord will judge me. And he's not. And look, our church is growing, and that's a sign that what I'm doing is, is good. And so they'll be very manipulative, very deceptive. And Peter uses this word over and over and over. So there's a huge danger within the church, and Peter warns us prophetically here. And he goes on from verse 4, and he says, well, here is what's going to happen to these teachers. For if God did not spare the angels who sinned, but cast them down to hell and deliver them into chains of darkness to be reserved for judgment and did not spare the ancient world, but saved Noah, one of eight people, a preacher of righteousness, bringing in the flood on the world of the ungodly and turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes, condemned them to destruction making them an example to those who afterward would live ungodly and delivered righteous lot who oppressed by the filthy conduct who was oppressed by the filthy conduct of the wicked for that righteous man dwelling among them tormented his righteous soul from day to day by seeing and hearing their lawless deeds then the lord knows how to deliver the godly out of temptations and to reserve the unjust under punishment for the day of judgment. In these five verses here, Peter is really trying to prove one thing. And that if these false teachers are saying, well, judgment hasn't come upon me. He's showing three examples of a very swift but patient judgment of God. We see first and foremost the very swift punishment of the fallen 
angels. And this goes right back to uh, the beginning parts of creation. After God had finished creating the heavens and the earth, and we see that Lucifer, one of the highest angelic beings, revolted against God and what, what God had planned. And he wanted to be God himself. And we read in the book of Revelations that with him he took a third of the angels. And these angels had an immediate swift destruction and judgment being brought upon them. And God says, look, even though these false teachers might say, well, well we're not being judged. That's a sign that God's with me. He's blessing me. He said, hold on, hold on, because look at how God works. Sometimes he'll do it immediately, like with the angels. But then next he presents to us the ancient world during Noah. And he gave 120 years of time. And he said, but righteous Noah and his family were saved from that. He gave 120 years. So God decides how to execute judgment. He also then provided the example of Lot. And he said, look, I waited for a long time for Sodom and Gomorrah. God even came down himself to witness what was going on. And then he said, that's it. I've had enough. Lot, come out. He sent his two angels and Lot and his wife and his two girls tried to escape. And we know what happened to his wife. But we see that there is different spans of time that God waited before he executed his final judgment. But the idea is that God will, God has always punished the wicked, and he has always preserved the righteous. Now, this is something that I think we're all hopeful in, because we, a lot of times, are like David. If you read a lot of the Psalms, David looks at this world and he says, Lord, I see something wrong. The wicked is prospering. Man, his business is going well. He is doing so great. And here I am. I'm being persecuted. I'm being haunted. I'm, I have to fight against this enemy here and that enemy on this other border here. And he's saying, what's going on? When will you bring about your judgment? For us as righteous people, we have to cultivate in our heart patience and relying upon the Lord and knowing that God, in your timing, if it's 120 years, if it's immediately, you know when to execute your righteous judgment. So Peter goes on from here and he talks about the depravity of these false teachers from verse 10. And he says, and especially those who walk according to the flesh, in the lust of uncleanness, in despise authority. They are presumptuous, self-willed. They are not afraid to speak evil of dignitaries. Whereas angels who are greater in power and might do not bring a reviling accusation against them before the Lord. But these, like natural brute beasts made to be caught and destroyed, speak evil of the things they do not understand and will utterly perish in their own corruption and will receive the wages of unrighteousness as those who count it pleasure to carouse in the daytime. They are spots and blemishes, carousing in their own deceptions while they feast with you having eyes full of adultery and that cannot cease from sin, enticing unstable souls. They have a heart trained in covetous practices and are accursed children. They have forsaken the right way and gone astray following the way of Balaam, the son of Beor, who loved the wages of unrighteousness, but he was rebuked for his iniquity. A dumb donkey speaking with a man's voice restrained the madness of the prophet. These are wells without water, clouds carried by a tempest, for whom is reserved the blackness of darkness forever. You see, 
this is such a huge, drastic difference between what we read in chapter 1, the description of the true Christian, but also to this very reason, giving all diligence to add to your faith virtue and to virtue knowledge and to knowledge self-control and to self-control perseverance and to perseverance godliness, brotherly kindness, and love. This is a stark contrast to what we just read. That's true Christianity. This here is false. And so I just wrote all of these descriptions down because there's really just one way to categorize them. It's just false. False, blatantly erroneous. Walking according to the flesh. These people will not, as Paul puts it, walk in the Spirit. They still love to do and to be in the same actions as in their past. They have this lust for uncleanly things. And this is really a word used about sacrifices. And the priests who, were, who had to purify themselves through the various ceremonies they had to go through and steps. And he's saying these people have not done that. He's saying they despise authority. First and foremost, they are just like Lucifer who despised God's authority, wanting to be God himself. They are presumptuous and self-willed. They want to do things their own way. They are so driven by their madness and by their pride that you just can't seem to talk these people out of anything. They are not afraid to speak evil and especially of dignitaries, especially of people in authority. There's, they just they want to be the end-all, be-all. And then here's a really, really horrible thing. They carouse in the daytime, and their eyes are full of adultery. All they care about, ultimately, at the end of the day, is fulfilling the desires of their flesh. And one of the most powerful drives that a human being has in the flesh is the sexual drive. And it's so hard to control it. And we see that a man apart from God, a man apart from that born again experience that brings in the transformative power of God cannot control his appetites. And so these men as well. Because they do not have God in them, with them, upon them. They have to become slaves to their own lusts and desires. And not just that, but this is how they end up teaching their false doctrines. They end up showing that, hey, th this is fine. This is fine. I remember we were in, in Haral once, and there, was, there were some people that started attending our church there um, from a town called Cerrito de Camargo. And there was a church already there. And they started coming, and some of them started coming because they were questioning what was going on in that church. And here we found out later what was going on. The pastor in this church had the weekly, at every one of the, the, the services, um, he had these, this habit of going around and like hugging all the women. And having sometimes some of those women sit in his lap. And this was all under the disguise of showing godly love. Because I'm God's servant here on earth, and so I'm going to show you how God loves. And so I need to display that physically. Such blatant errors. Scripture never teaches us that. Scripture teaches us how to put boundaries to that. But churches like this exist left and right out there. 
That was the first time I heard of something like this. And, and first, I was just angry. I was angry that in, a, in already a country that already has so many false churches that something like this and taking advantage of innocent people like that would even happen. They carouse in the daytime, their eyes are full of adultery, and they entice unstable souls. They know that these people have probably never read the Bible, and they just take whatever they hear from a pastor because they trust a person with that title and position. We have to be very careful of these types of men and people. Their heart is trained in covetousness. They are accursed children. They train themselves this way. And you say, how? How do you, how do you train yourself in something like this? Well, when you're prideful, and when that's all you do day in, day out, self-willed, it's all about the lust of your flesh, that's a way of training and exercising yourself to just fulfill your own desires. They forsake the right way. And we are given here an example. We are given here the example of another prophet of the Old Testament. But this time, it's a horrible prophet. And this is Balaam. And Balaam coveted quite a bit. He loved money. And... It, Initially, he denied the request of Balak to go and to curse the children of Israel. But, you know, he said, I still got to find a way to obey the Lord and not to go and do that, but also to obtain the money. And so he gave Balak some advice. And he says, here is how you do this. Here is how you strip away the power of the children of Israel. And it's exactly this description here. Entice their sons to marry your daughters. And you'll see how they'll start worshiping false gods. And they will not worship the true God. And once that happens, their power goes away. And you can come in and take control. A false prophet, even though what he prophesied was true. And God used him and spoke through him. And even a prophecy about Jesus. But this false prophet used and was, covet, was covetous. And we see his demise. We see that God punished him swiftly. This is what we have to be able to detect. And lastly, it gives us these two descriptions, which are very important, especially for people who are living in the Middle East in arid climates. These are wells without water, clouds carried by a tempest. This is very interesting because when you think about teachers and think about the fact that they are supposed to be imparting the Word of God, you, we think about the Word of God as being food and nourishment to our souls, right? Well, in the Middle East and in these arid climates, imagine traveling and reaching a well and imagine the disappointment that you have when you drop the bucket in and you pull it up and it's empty and it's dry. That is the same feeling and of realization that people will get when they listen to these false prophets and they probably have been in that church for a long time and they've been listening and at the end of the day, finally their eyes are open and they realize, man, this is an empty well. And imagine that desire to be drinking. You're in a hot, arid climate and you want to have that sip of cool, clean water and you're denied that opportunity. That is exactly the same feeling people will have once they come to the realization that they've been in a place where it's just been false after false after false teachings. 
Now, it's interesting how the devil works. Because with every true thing that God comes and reveals, the devil will always come with a counterfeit. With every great awakening that there's been, and every great reformation or revival, there has always been a counterfeit revival to it. If we just look in the last 200 years at some of those examples, we know that there was in the 1700s the first great awakening, and the 1800s the second great awakening, and in the 1900s that third wave that started with Billy Graham, right? To each of these movements, there has been a counter movement. And when you look at when the Mormon church started in America by Joseph Smith in the mid to late 1800s, when you look at the Jehovah's Witnesses, the Church of Scientology, these have all been started as counterfeit movements to true revivals and reformations that have taken place in the church. Even to the latest movement here in America, started by Billy Graham and the Calvary Chapel churches, there has been the counterfeit movement of the prosperity gospel. And now, the social gospel. We have to be very careful to understand that the devil doesn't sleep. He knows his time is short and he wants to take as many people along for the ride with him. So how does this occur? We've gotten some great descriptions of what a false teacher is. But what do they bring? Let's read on from verse 18. For when they speak great swelling words of emptiness, they allure through the lusts of the flesh, through lewdness, the ones who have actually escaped from those who live in error. While they promise them liberty, they themselves are slaves of corruption. For by whom a person is overcome, by him also he is brought into bondage. For if, after they have escaped the pollutions of the world, through the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, they are again entangled in them and overcome. The latter end is worse for them than the beginning. For it would have been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than having known it to turn from the holy commandment delivered to them. But it has happened to them according to the true proverb, quote, a dog returns to his own vomit and a sow having washed to her wallowing in the mire, end quote. There are three deceptions that Peter brings out here. And the first is the deception of intellectuality. The second is the deception of carnality. And the third is the deception of liberty. And this seems to happen over and over and over, just in different ways within the church. First is the deception of intellectuality. Peter says, For when they speak great swelling words of emptiness, these people sound so smart. They bring up such great philosophical arguments. They will go as far as to proving to you scientifically how this can't be possible and how this should be the way. And especially in the last 150 years, the church scientifically has been attacked and the Bible's authority and inerrancy has been placed at stake because of these kinds of people. The deception of of intellectuality. For 1800 years, the church had always believed that Genesis was written as a literal historical book. And that Genesis chapter 1 and 2 was an accurate description of the account of creation. And that the days that were mentioned in Genesis were literal 24 hour days as we experience them today. But there were two very important scientists who came along in the early to mid-1800s, and that was Charles Lyell and Charles Darwin. Charles Lyell brought about the understanding in geology 
And he looked at and he studied uh, rocks in, in, in geolo geology, and he came up with the term geological timeline. He was the one that determined that, you know what? Rocks have an age. And by the way that he studied them and determined how you, uh, what, by what method or process do you investigate and determine ages of rock, he determined that the earth must be at least millions of years old. And he was the one, if you guys remember your science classes, the different stratas and layers of the earth. So he's basically saying the deeper you go, you fall into different layers, and those different layers represent different ages. Uh, later on in time, they would be categorized as, you know, the, the, the metamorphic layer and all of these different layers, right? Well, we know that is false science because we have many examples of animals that should only be, even according to them, all right, a few hundred thousand years old, but they're lodged within a geological layer that should be millions of years old. How does that happen? So there's huge contradictions with that. Charles Darwin, as most of us know, came up with this theory of evolution called natural selection. And even that has been proven to be erroneous because by natural selection, we should have many, many fossils called transitional fossils. That means when you go from a lower order species to a higher order species, there was a lot of uh, trial and error going on, all right? Now, during that trial and error process, there should be, let's just call it from monkeys to humans, there should be a lot of half humans or half monkeys, whichever way you want to look at it, right? We can't find any of those transitional fossils. But guess what happened in the church as a result of this scientific, you know, new understanding? They came in with new ways of interpreting Scripture, the day-age theory and the gap theory. The day-age theory says, well, between each one of these days, or each one of these days was actually not a 24-hour day. But it could have been millions of years because to God, a day is like a thousand years and a thousand years is like a day. And then the gap theory said, well, maybe between those days, God described, okay, on a day, he did this. And the next time, a second day, when he decided to make the next thing, there was a gap between those days, and that could have been millions of years. You see how we're trying now to fit a square peg in a round hole? That's when, for the first time, these kind of doctrines started you know, popping up in the church. Today, we have other things, strict, even from science, even though we've disproven both Charles Lyell and Charles Darwin, these same doctrines and theories still, 150 years later, exist today in the church. One of the greatest intellectuals of our day was Stephen Hawking. And Stephen Hawking, in one of his last books called um, the, the Grand Design, this is what he wrote. He says, because there is a law such as gravity, the universe can and will create itself from nothing. Spontaneous creation is the reason there is something rather than nothing. Why the universe exists. Why we exist. Now this is a brilliant scientist, but what I just read from his own book doesn't sound scientific at all. It sounds very philosophical. He's basically saying that because something exists, nothing will create something. That is a fallacious argument philosophically. Oh, because Pastor Agent's right there on the front row, we know he exists. That's all it's basically trying to say. But this is the man who's supposed to have come up with the most intellectual approach to determining our existence apart from God. And one of the biggest things that he wrote in this last book was what is called today as quantum theory, 
which has led to an understanding today of the multiverse. Again, the allure with great words of emptiness. And let me explain <laughs> this. Quantum theory has led to the multiverse argument by scientists, and the multiverse argument by scientists is really to counteract an argument from Christian scientists that is called the fine-tuning argument. The fine-tuning argument says that there are so many things in our universe that are so precise that have had to come about in existence all at the same time time because if you just mess around with one of those things you destroy the entire universe existence is not possible and scientists are slowly starting to understand this and, and, and to come to the realization that whoa we we have no way and a lot of scientists through this fine-tuning argument that Michael Behe um, has has written in a book called uh, Darwin's Black Box and so here is Stephen Hawking trying to counteract through quantum theory and the multiverse concept. And here's what he says. He says, well, that's great. And I agree with you guys. But here's what you guys have overlooked in your fine-tuning argument. What if, what if there are multiple universes? What if there are an infinite amount of universes and in each one of those universes, there are different laws, and it just so happens to be that the one we exist in happens to have the laws and the perfect laws for the type of life we experience. They're trying to take away the probability argument. If you recall, last time we talked about these huge statistics of how just even eight prophecies in Scripture, right? it would be like 1 times 10 to the power of like 137 for them to be fulfilled. Same thing with the fine-tuning argument. It, it is the possibility of a universe like this to exist is zero if it had not all happened together. So they're trying just to say, well, then all of those infinite possibilities exist somewhere else. We just happen to exist in the one possibility that makes our reality true. To which I love Professor John Lennox's response to Stephen Hawking. Because science is supposed to test. You're supposed to be able to test that those universes are true. This is just a philosophical argument that they might exist. You can never know. We're stuck in our universe. How could we ever transport ourselves to the other? So Professor John Lennox said to Stephen Hawking, he says, Stephen, I hear rumors that there's a heaven. <laughs> because really, that's what it is. It's wishful thinking on their part to them. To us, it's heaven. There's a heaven there's, that we can't necessarily prove scientifically. We can prove through other means that it exists. But this is to the, the degree that these scientists, through all of these words of emptiness at the end of the day, that even us, without a doctors in physics, can really you know, be able to disprove their theories. The second is the deception of carnality. And this is where it gets us. The allure through the lusts of the flesh. John writes to the church later on, 30 years later after this, and he says, watch out for the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. This will get us all the time. And this is a great deception. And thirdly, it's the deception of liberty. And this is what's happening to us, especially today. These, these self-help churches, these gurus of how to take Scripture and turn your life into the perfect life and live your left, best life today. They promise you this liberty if you'll only follow and be yourself. Be the best you that you can be. And yes, to a certain degree, that's true. There is only one you. There is only one you that ever was, is, or will be. God has created all of us as unique beings. But to extrapolate that to the way that they teach is, is false. And this liberty that they preach is in fact going right back 
to enslavement. Because Peter says in Galatians, not Peter, Paul says in Galatians chapter 5, verse 13, he says, watch out. Watch out. Don't use the excuse of liberty to go back into your old ways, but in love, serve one another. And that's important. That's important because Paul had to contend with the arguments of, well, you know, we're, we're saved now. We can do whatever we want. We have liberty in Christ. We're, nothing's going to happen to us. And Paul says, do we just, you know, sin because we know that where sin is, grace abounds more? No. Far be it from me to do something like that. So we have to watch out for these three deceptions. And Peter closes us off with the great falling away. If you are deceived by these three, here's what will happen. You're going to fall away. Even if you were, it says is for even if after they have escaped the pollutions of this world through the knowledge. So there are people who have given their lives to the Lord, have escaped all of that. They've accepted the knowledge of Jesus Christ. And now through these false teachings have gone right back to the unfortunate proverb of the dog goes back to his vomit and the pig right back to his mud hole where he likes to bathe. Now, obviously, there's two ways that Christians interpret these passages. One through the Calvinist mindset that will wait up. You know, we have to interpret verse 20 and 21 through the eyes of verse 22 uh, because the dog is still a dog and the pig is still a pig. They were trying on the outside to wash themselves and to be something differently, but on the inside, you can never change them. Um, obviously, that, that's just a proverb. There's also the Armenian way of looking at it that, hey, you can lose your salvation, and this is a perfect example of it. Regardless of which way you want to take it, of you can fall away, or you're just a fake, you never were true, and you have always been fallen away, the idea is that you're going to be destroyed. That's the idea. You can't fake it till you make it. You can't fake God. And this entire chapter has been dedicated to Peter explaining to these Christians, here's the false, but here's the judgment, and here's the destruction that will come about. There, we don't want to be in that category of people. We'd rather be in chapter 1, cultivating a Christ like character. And so, as a closing, we know that we have to live in holiness, right? And that is abstaining from all of these fleshly lusts. You know, God is not just a God who says, don't do this, don't do that, don't drink, don't play poker, don't gamble, don't do this. He tells us in chapter 1 what to be like. But there's also hope, and the hope that we have is that God will punish the wicked but he will preserve the righteous. He hasn't given us an impossible task. Lord, how will I overcome the lusts of my flesh? Oh, you will. You will. The Holy Spirit in you. You will see the transformative power of, of God. And in a heretical church, watch out, because depravity and deception run rampant. They run rampant. So be alert. This is a big warning chapter. Peter's saying, be alert. False teachers and their deceptive ways are going to entice you to sin, resulting ultimately in apostasy or falling away. So as true Christians, seeing all of this, it is our responsibility, number one, to cultivate a Christ-like character in us, but now we can also call out the false teachers. And we're supposed to watch out for our flock and making sure that we are walking in the straight and narrow path that God has outlined for us. So let us stand up in this closing prayer and let's be aware, let's be attentive. First Peter finished off with Peter saying, watch out because the devil roars, prowls around like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. And he devours them through these false teachers who look like what we read here in chapter, chapter 2. 
So may the Lord strengthen us to be real, to be honest, to be sincere, and to have a life and a heart that is completely devoted to him. Amen.